The sky offered an interesting mystery that grew louder with each new camera frame. Researchers raced to find major telescopes in Hawaii, space, and Chile. Messages were passed between experts at Atlas Nor Lab, STSCI, and the James Webb Group of Space Telescopes. Interest rose quickly because the object moved on an unusual path. Spectra and images promised strong facts about an object from an additional dimension. This video will walk you through those details and their discovered telescopes stay with us. But what exactly was this odd traveler doing through the night sky? A comet, an asteroid, or something beyond our models entirely something that could challenge everything we know. As of July 1, 2025, the impact alert system known as ATLAS reported a new moving object in the southern sky. Each night, ATLAS scans large areas from Haleakob in Hawaii and flags faint moving points. Within hours, the Zwicky Transient Facility in California and Pan Stars in Hawaii reported matching detections. Observers noted a hazy glow around a bright center a sign that gas and dust were forming a cometary coma. The Minor Planet Center received the positions and ran orbital fits to test possible paths. Observers in Chile and the United States quickly moved to confirm the discovery. Gemini South, the Southern Astrophysical System, and the Cerro Pachin Research Telescope took deeper images that mapped the tail and tracked brightness changes. NASA's Infrared Telescope measured heat in the near-infrared, while many smaller observatories fed time-stamped images into open archives. Scientists searched older survey data and found the object in recovery frames from the transiting exoplanet survey satellite and pan stars. Those older frames showed it faintly weeks earlier, which helped refine the trajectory and the timeline of activity. Researchers from Caltech, Harvard, the University of Arizona, and the University of Hawaii compared data and shared refined positions, color measurements, and early spectra. Private groups, led by Matthew Hopkins, Bryce Bullen, and Daryl Seligman, posted technical descriptions outlining preliminary fits and models for the release of gas. Early low-resolution spectroscopy and narrowband imaging from ground-based spectrographs detected lines and features that suggested volatile release. Those early spectra indicated ongoing outgassing rather than a single explosive event, and observers watched the coma brighten for a couple of days. The Minor Planet Center and participating observatories updated orbital solutions as new positions arrived. The improved fits revealed a hyperbolic eccentricity, a key number showing the object is not bound to the sun. An incoming velocity higher than most solar system comets was measured by observers. That speed and the hyperbolic path instructed teams to categorize the object as interstellar and to assign the label 3i. Atlas with a provisional code number C to O to 5 and 1 for publication. Tracking data flowed rapidly across both public and private working groups. Staff at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore prepared target lists and requested high-resolution Hubble images to try to separate any nucleus from the surrounding coma. Within days, the Hubble Space Telescope observed the object and provided sharper views. Ground telescopes continued nightly monitoring to measure changes in tail length and direction so scientists could estimate particle speeds and dust sizes. The quick global response produced a large number of observations from survey cameras, medium telescopes, and flagship observatories. Those combined data gave a clear record of discovery, early composition hints, dust measurements, and a precise orbit. The coordinated effort set the stage for follow-up time on the James Webb Space Telescope and other instruments to study the object in infrared detail. Observers also noted that the object is the third overall confirmed interstellar visitor. But sharp images alone weren't enough because beneath the glowing blur could be a clue to whether this was merely cosmic debris or something far stranger. The Hubble Space Telescope returned very sharp images of 3 ATLAS. 
The STSCI team used those images to distinguish between the bright coma and any direct nucleus. Their analysis set a conservative upper limit on the nucleus diameter near 5.6 to 6 kilometers, while noting the solid core could be much smaller, perhaps just a few hundred meters. The bright cloud of dust and gas around the object makes direct measurement difficult. Ground telescopes added crucial context. The Gemini Observatory on Cerro Pachin in Chile took image sequences that showed a growing tail and steady brightening over several weeks. Scientists at the National Science Foundation's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory processed wide-field frames to monitor the length and shape of the tail throughout the night. Observers at the Research in Southern Astrophysics International Serret Observatory and Telescope Observatory ran follow-up imaging to map how dust fans changed with time. Those working in the infrared used the NASA Infrared Telescope facility to measure heat and search for icy grains. Near-infrared spectra showed a flattening at longer wavelengths that corresponded to the presence of large water ice grains in the coma. The spectrum is used in some analyzes. Shapes and color trends from Gemini South and the Infrared Telescope facility helped identify dust particle sizes and basic surface properties. Before the official discovery, surveyors provided early views. NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite and the Vera C. Rubin Observatory recorded the object in archived frames. Those recovery images showed faint activity weeks earlier and helped refine the orbit. Comparing images from various times allowed astronomers to confirm that there was activity far from the Sun, which then increased gradually. The consistent increase in brightness pointed to volatile ices as the source of the outgassing, instead of just one outburst. Scientists measured coma brightness and converted flux into dust production estimates using standard comet models. They tracked how the tail length changed and used those measurements to estimate particle speeds. Smaller, faster-moving grains formed a wider fan. Larger grains moved more slowly and stayed near the main trail. Tracking speeds over several nights let them estimate grain sizes and mass loss rates in kilograms per second. Ultraviolet observations from the Neil Garrel Swift Observatory detected emission associated with water loss at the end of July and early August. Those signals suggested ice grains sublimating or water vapor present in the coma at that time, though different teams reported varying signal strengths. Optical spectra from some large telescopes also showed gas features such as cyanide and faint metal lines in the coma. Taken together, the Hubble data and groundwork produced a layered view. Sharp Hubble frames provided limits on the nucleus and revealed structure in the inner coma. Wide field and infrared data measured tail length, dust speeds, and the presence of ice grains farther out. The set of observations guided the community toward the next round of observations and teams shared data widely online. Many university groups and students contributed observations that quickly filled gaps in the public record. On August 6, 2025, the James Webb Space Telescope opened observations using its near-IR spectrograph to observe three Atlas targets. Webb recorded infrared light from the coma and produced a spectrum that showed how different molecules absorb and emit energy. The spectrum contained clear bands that matched carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide features appeared stronger than the water features in parts of the coma that Webb sampled. The SPHERIX mission recorded matching infrared features a few days later, giving independent confirmation. Spectroscopy works by comparing observed light to laboratory fingerprints for known molecules. Carbon dioxide has strong, well-known bands in the infrared, which Webb captured clearly. Water also has bands visible in the near-infrared, but in these observations they were weaker. Observers also found smaller amounts of carbon monoxide and faint traces of sulfur-bearing molecules such as carbonyl sulfide. Teams from Caltech, Harvard University, and the University of Arizona organized their own opposition studies of the spectra to check results. To turn band strengths into physical numbers, researchers used laboratory cross-sections and simple coma models. 
Laboratory cross-sections show how strongly a molecule absorbs at a given wavelength. Using that data and the measured band brightness, scientists estimated how many molecules were present. Those numbers converted into gas production rates expressed in kilograms per second. Multiple groups ran that conversion and reported consistent ranges for carbon dioxide and lower rates for water. Web spectra also revealed line shapes and Doppler shifts. Line widths and shifts give information about gas motion in the coma. A broader line usually means faster moving gas. Measured gas speeds for the observed bands fit the range expected for cometary outflow at these distances from the sun. Researchers combined gas speeds and production rates to build physical models of activity. Those models test whether gas escapes from a small number of isolated vents on the surface or from a larger area across the nucleus. Current fits narrow the plausible options but do not yet eliminate either. The high carbon dioxide to water ratio can come from several physical causes. One possibility is formation in a cold region of the protoplanetary disk where carbon dioxide condensed and remained plentiful. Another possibility is a surface layer that holds ice and water below, while carbon dioxide leaks out of deeper layers or fractures. A third option is long exposure to cosmic rays and interstellar radiation that altered the outer layer and reduced surface water.